Hello, today we are interviewing Daphne Koller, president and co-founder of Coursera. Daphne Koller, welcome and thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. In uh, 2012, you co-founded Coursera with Andrew Ng. Mm -hmm. What gave you the idea of starting this educational technology offering massive open online courses or MOOCs? Uh, Andrew and I, as well as several other colleagues at Stanford, had been working for a number of years on the use of technology for teaching, both for on-campus Stanford students, but also for getting the educational offerings that we have to so many more people around the world. And the work that we did led in the fall of 2011 to the offering of what are now the first three MOOCs, um, where uh, we took three graduate courses in computer science and made them freely available to anyone. We didn't know what would happen, but within a matter of weeks, each of those courses had an enrollment of 100,000 people or more. And that was clearly an opportunity that we couldn't pass up, the um, potential of giving so many people who have no access to high quality education the opportunity to take a Stanford course was just um, enormous and we then decided that it didn't make sense to just restrict us to Stanford courses. We wanted to work with multiple top universities which led us to spin this out of Stanford as a separate venture in early 2012 so that we could work with multiple universities including the Corporate Technique. Thank you. And in an uh, interview given to the Wall Street Journal, you called uh, MOOCs a transformative, not disruptive force mm -hmm. in education. That's right. Do you still believe that's true and why? I do because I don't think we're actually disrupting the traditional educational offerings that um, institutions offer to their on-campus students. We believe that there will always be a role for face-to-face -face teaching, that that type of teaching will be transformed because it no longer makes sense to provide um, uh, content delivery and basic skills practice within the classroom. Rather, the classroom time should be devoted to something that's much more engaging and interactive. Where I think we will be disruptive is, our, is for the people who are not currently consumers of education, people who have no access to high quality education, either because that doesn't exist in their country or because they're long out of school and have no ability to come back because of other commitments. And the fact that these people can now reskill themselves or upskill themselves and get access to a job that's much better than they had before, that is, I think, a major disruption. So you're speaking about giving access to education for everyone, but Coursera is a for-profit organization. Mm -hmm. For a while, people were questioning your business model. With uh, verified certificates and the signature track programs, is it enough for Coursera to make profits? We hope so. Uh, we don't yet, we're not yet profitable, but there is a steady and rapidly increasing revenue stream that we've been able to bring to bear as the value of the credentials among employers becomes much clearer. And so people are signing up for this because they know that it will give them an opportunity to get a better job. Right now, um, about 70% of the people who get a verified certificate post that on LinkedIn. And if you looked at the statistics, from LinkedIn, you'll see that we're the second largest provider of credentials right after Microsoft. Um, and this is in less than two years that the credential has been offered. So I think there's definitely a growing uptake on the credentials. And as the user base that we have continues to grow, uh, we hope that it will be enough to offset our fixed costs of developing the platform. You mentioned growing. Well, uh, with millions of dollars raised in venture capital, 10 millions of users as of October and courses given in certain languages, mm -hmm. Coursera has been expanding very rapidly yeah. over the last two years. Mm -hmm. How do you explain this success? I think you give people a very high quality product at a very affordable price, mm -hmm. free. Um, and uh, there is clearly a hunger out there for, for high quality educational offerings. Um, I think partly it's driven by the fact that the world around us is accelerating in its, in its movement. And uh, you know, 30 years ago, you could go to school and what you learned in school would be enough to last your entire life. That's not true anymore. Many of the skills that people need in today's job market didn't exist 15 years ago when people went to school. Think of digital marketing, which is one of the upcoming specializations that we're about to offer. 
if you learned marketing 15 years ago was all about newspaper advertising and spots on TV, whereas now it's all about Facebook and Twitter, which didn't even exist. Mm -hmm. So I think there, the need for reskilling is only accelerating. So with such a success, the question we want to ask is what's next? Can you tell us a bit about Coursera's future and project? Yeah. So I'd like to divide the answer into two parts. Uh, the first part is, I think, just the enormous opportunity of, of free, accessible education. Right now, we have close to 900 courses, as you said, in 13 different languages, but um, most courses are only offered in, still in English. Um, and 900 courses might seem like a lot, but the curriculum of a mid-sized university is more like 5,000 courses. Mm -hmm. In five years, I'd like to have 5,000 courses, and I'd like them to be offered in most of at least the major languages so that you can teach anybody, anywhere, anything they want to learn. And I think that will be hugely transformative to world welfare. Um, a second aspect of our future, I think, is a little bit further out and uh, focuses on, leverages the fact that we have what is probably one of the largest and fastest growing collections of data about human learning and effectiveness of teaching of anyone out there. Um, up until now, the science of pedagogy, of how to teach people well, has been largely anecdotal. You do a study on 10 people in a particular campus and you'd hope that that extrapolates mm -hmm. to hundreds of thousands of people all over the world. Uh, we now have data about millions of people and they are all over the world, which is going to give us a unique ability mm -hmm. to really evaluate how to teach people effectively and constantly iterate and refine on new pedagogical techniques. And I think if we're lucky, that could lead to a step function in ability to teach effectively in much the same way that big data in uh, genomics, for example, has led to a much deeper understanding of disease processes and, and how to cure disease. And I think that's a tremendous opportunity um, for us to exploit. Well, that sounds like a great program. Uh, Ecole Polytechnique was the first French institution to announce a joint Coursera yes. in February 2013. Yes. How do you decide which university to include? Uh, well, we were very happy when we had uh, the connection to Ecole Polytechnique. They're an outstanding institution and we were privileged to partner with them. Um, Mostly, we, and ge we, ge we generally aim to partner with the best universities around the world, and the Cole Polytechnique was one of those. Um, right now, we're really focused on deepening the relationships that we have with our existing partners and uh, potentially recruiting a relatively small number of additional partners that have considerable additionality beyond what we already have. Um, but really, we focus very much on, on quality. And do you know what proportion of Coursera students come from France? And do you observe a particular interest mm -hmm. for courses given in French, such as courses from Ecole Polytechnique? So right now we have around 1.5% of our learners come from France and French-speaking countries in Africa. The vast majority of those come from France, um, partly because of infrastructure issues in, in Africa. Um, if you look at the courses that are of greatest interest to this, um, to this audience, uh, those are seven of the ten are courses in French uh, that come from our French partners and also from our French-speaking uh, Swiss partners. Um, there are, I think, one or two of the Ecole Polytechnique courses are, are on that list, and we hope that there will be more. Uh, from a subject area perspective, the courses that are uh, appealing to these French learners are primarily skills-based courses in, mm -hmm. in computing, in business, and in cognitive thinking skills. Daphne Collar, many thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>